behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till they, till they came and stood where the young child was. Matthew 2, 9. We're going to do beautiful star, Bethlehem, and we'd like for you
virgin will be with a child who will give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Luke 2, 19. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? 
called the Son of God. Luke 134.
the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen. Luke 2.20 
wonderful, joyful. Amen? Amen. And you kiddos did great. Each of you involved. Very, very good. Praise the Lord. Oh, my. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. If you have your Bibles with you and you'd like to follow along reading, I want to read Luke's account of the birth of Jesus. Gospel of uh, Gospel Luke, chapter 2. Let's read the Christmas story here. And here's what it says. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing, governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. This morning, I just want to speak briefly to you. A message I've titled, The Night Christ Was Born. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for that O Holy Night, the night that Christ was born. Would you please bless this message now? Speak to our hearts. For we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen and Amen. A long, long time ago, in a little town far, far away from Kennard, Texas, <laughs> an angel suddenly appeared before a group of shepherds who were out in the fields keeping their flocks. The Bible doesn't tell us how many shepherds there were. Evidently, there were at least two. And so the angel stood there. It doesn't say the angel was in the air. The angel stood there, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and the angel gave a very powerful 
personal message to those shepherds that night. He told them, For there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, it must have been an incredible moment for those shepherds when they heard those words. A moment that they would never, ever forget. And you know, you and I, we've had moments like that. Not that we've seen an angel, but moments in which something very good happened to us or maybe perhaps something bad happened to us. It was a moment that we often refer to as an earth-shattering moment. And you know what? We never forget those moments, do we? We don't forget those. And those shepherds would never forget what happened to them that night. Now, from our passage here, I want to share with you four things that happened on the night Christ was born. First of all, number one, the night Christ was born, God's promises were fulfilled. I'm talking about the promises of sending the Christ in the world. God's promises were fulfilled. We saw last Sunday that God had promised through the prophets that one day the Christ, the Messiah, was going to come into the world. Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah predicted that a son would be given, a child would be born. In Isaiah chapter 7, as you heard in the play just a few minutes ago, the, the Christmas uh, moment that we had, we, we, found, we learned that uh, Jesus was going to be born of a virgin. He was going to be virgin born. And then, of course, he was going to be born in the little town of Bethlehem, according to the prophet Micah. And so, folks, here it is right here in Luke chapter 2. Amen? The fulfillment of those particular prophecies. Dr. Luke gives it to us right here at just the right moment at just the right time, on just the right day in history, Jesus Christ came into the world. The Son was given to the nation Israel. You know, God always does what He says He's going to do. At the time, the right time, in which He wants to do it. He's never too early, never too late in our lives. Sometimes we may think He's running a little late. Amen? But he's not. He's always on time. And that's exactly what Galatians 4, 4 says. It says that when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Don't miss that. Not born of a man, but born of a woman, born under the law. He came under the law of Moses. You know, Jesus was God's gift to the whole world. Amen? Now, the shepherds were told in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. In other words, to you shepherds, this Savior, Savior has come. In other words, to Israel. Israel now has the Son. He's been born. But don't miss verse 10. He said, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to who? All people. All of the human race. And I'm so thankful for that. Amen. Because that means it's good news for not only the Jews, but also for those of us who are Gentiles. And anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile. And so, praise God, the night Christ was born, God's promises were fulfilled. But number two, not only that, the night Christ was born, God's enemy was chilled. God's enemy was chilled. You know, Satan was not a happy camper when Jesus was born that night in Bethlehem. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I believe not long after he, Jesus was born, Satan had a call business meeting with some of his top-notch demons, and I believe that some heads rolled that particular day. Amen? And I believe some of those top-notch demons were demoted because of the fact that they allowed this to happen. When you follow the Old Testament, you follow the Scriptures, you see that throughout the centuries, Satan had done his very best. He had worked to prevent this from happening, to somehow to corrupt the seed line of the Messiah. So, 
that Jesus would never come into the world. Goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15, the very first prophecy of the Messiah coming. And remember, God was speaking to Satan that particular moment. And he told him that the seed of the woman of Eve, a particular seed, was going to be born. And that seed would bruise Satan's head. The seed, uh, Satan would bruise the, Satan, uh, the, the seed's foot, okay? His heel, which he did on, uh, Satan bruised Jesus on the cross. But the seed would bruise the head of the serpent. And praise God, Satan is defeated. He doesn't believe he is, but he's a defeated foe even right now. And so throughout the centuries, he had tried to stop the birth. He immediately began with Cain. He had Cain raise up and slay his brother Abel. And Satan probably thought, well, that takes care of that seed line. No, the seed line was coming through Seth. And if you go back to the book of Genesis and you look at the genealogy and you see from Seth, we have Enoch, the man who walked with God. And then we have Methuselah. And then we have Noah. Noah made it all the way through the flood. How many of you know that? Amen? He was riding on a little buck, by the way. And then you follow the sea line. goes through Boaz, through Jesse, David. And the scriptures were very clear that the Messiah, the Savior, would be in the line of David. You go to the books of Matthew and Luke and you find the genealogy that goes through Joseph. It goes all the way back to David. You go to the Gospel of Luke. The genealogy through Mary goes all the way back to David. And so, the devil didn't win. And he kept trying, even when Israel was in Egypt, in bondage. And you remember what Pharaoh was trying to do? Satan used Pharaoh and said, I want you to make sure those midwives kill all the male children that are born. But you know what? There was a little bitty baby named Moses who slipped through Amen? Floating down Nile River in a little basket. The seed line continued. You go on into the book of Esther and you find a man, an evil man by the name of Haman. And while the Jews were under the Persian Empire, and Haman concocted a plan to annihilate all of the Jews, believe me, he was definitely anti-Semitic. And so, the king... He thought it was a good plan. He didn't know what was going on. But you know what? God had Esther right there with Mordecai to make sure that didn't happen. And the seed line continued on. And the Christ child was born. Amen? Yeah. Satan could not prevent it. <laughs> the enemy was chilled. Yes, Satan wanted to be the Grinch who stole Christmas. But God gave him the big chill. He froze him out and said, No, you're not going to stop this from happening. Amen? Praise God. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You see, while the birth of Jesus brought hope into the world, it brought misery to the devil. You say, Well, why is that? Because now people like you and me, we have hope in Jesus Christ. Amen? We have hope of our salvation through Jesus. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Star Wars saga. As you know, I'm a Star Wars fan. But anyway, in that particular saga, in the Revenge of the Sith, we find the evil empire begins to rise. And the evil emperor, I mean, man, he's now ruling over the entire galaxy and everything is in chaos and, and mayhem is going on and all and, and of course uh, a, a very weak, meek rebel force, they're doing their best to try to rise up against this evil that's before them and they, they just look around and they say, man we need some hope and you know what there is a new hope that rises up and the name happens to be Skywalker but anyway, that was a new hope for them, amen? But you know what? Our hope is not in Skywalker. Our hope is in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? That's where our hope lies. And so God's 
enemy was killed that particular day. Not only the night Christ was born, not only was God's promises fulfilled and God's enemy chilled, but number three, God's Son was revealed. God's Son was revealed. The good news of a Savior's birth was announced not to kings, not to the elite, not to the religious leaders, but to lowly shepherds out in the fields. I want you to think about that because, folks, in that day, shepherds were not really considered to be, you know, like they were back in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In those days, they were, they were you know, fairly good, uh, the, the higher class, so to speak. But the shepherds of that day were considered to be low class. In fact, many people looked at them like the tax collectors of that day. And the tax collectors were hated. And so the shepherds were, you know, they were unlearned. Uh, people just really avoided them. But those were the types of people. Shepherds were the ones who got the good news that night. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. The shepherds were told in verse 12, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now, there was nothing unusual about a baby being wrapped up in, in the cloths, okay? the swaddling cloths. That was, that's what they did with the babies. That wasn't unusual. But what was unusual was that baby was going to be lying in a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. A feeding trough. Notice the sign was not look for that star that's right over that stable. The angel didn't tell them that. Don't look. You're not looking for a star. You are looking for a feeding trough. That means it's going to be in a stable. And you're looking for a little baby that's lying in a feeding trough. That's the sign. Well, what did they do? Well, verse 15 says, the shepherd said, let us now go to Bethlehem. Let's go see all of this that the Lord has revealed to us. Let's go check it out. And verse 16 says, they came with haste. They didn't waste any time. They did. They didn't say, well, why don't we go buy a burger right quick and get us a hamburger first before we go see this. No. Amen. Burger normally stays up all night, doesn't it? <laughs> but they didn't do that. They made haste. They wanted to see what God had done for them. And look what it says in verse 16. They came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Dr. Luke makes sure he puts that in there so that we'll know they found the right baby. It's the one lying in the feeding trough. Amen? Amen. They found a Savior. And when they looked down at that baby, they were looking at God. That was the Son of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. Remember, Jesus' beginning doesn't start in that little town of Bethlehem. Jesus has always existed up in heaven. He existed before that as the Word of God. And that's why it says God sent His Son into the world. He was already in existence. But God took on human flesh. And those shepherds were looking at that little baby was there light emanating from that little child, like on the picture on the screen? Maybe. Maybe not. We really don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But they were looking at God. They were looking at God. All the shepherds knew is this was the Savior. They didn't have all the information we have in the Word of God to be able to understand this. Amen? But it was the Savior. And you know what? Whether or not there was light coming from that little, little baby emanating out from that child or not, the Bible still says Jesus is the light of the world. Amen? 
He is the light of the world. And you know what? The light, that baby's light, the light of God still shines today, doesn't it? It still shines. It shines from the pages of this book, the Word of the Living God. God's light shines. It shines from every heart that has encountered Jesus and knows Him as Lord and Savior. That person has been that has been born the second time spiritually. That the Bible says we must have if we want to go to heaven. We have to have that second birth, that spiritual birth. Your physical birth won't get you to heaven. You've got to have two births. Physical, spiritual. Amen? First birth, physical. Second birth, spiritual. Jesus himself said it later on. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Got to have it. The light of God shines from every home today that has made Jesus Lord in their home. And the light of God shines in every church in which Jesus Christ is proclaimed and the Word of God is proclaimed. That's why the light of God is in this place today. Amen? We're proclaiming that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Well, the night Christ was born, not only was God's promises fulfilled, God's enemy chilled, God's Son revealed, but number four, God's witnesses were thrilled. God's witnesses were thrilled. The shepherds celebrated when they found the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe they were kicking up their heels, or should I say their sandals? Amen? It began when they were encountered the angel. They were shaking in their sandals. But it ended with them jumping up and down in their sandals and just being really, really excited. You know, verse 17 says, When they had seen Jesus, they, let, they made widely known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. In other words, a Savior's been born. They began to tell everybody. They became instant witnesses. Amen? Amen? And verse 20 says, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. They were excited. They became instant worshipers. Instant witnesses and instant worshipers. Just like that. And you know, that's what we are as the children of God. We are witnesses. We are worshipers. Amen? We witness with our lips and with our life. And we worship with our lips from our heart and with our life. We worship. We witness. Amen. Well, the shepherds' lives were impacted that night. There's absolutely no doubt about that. They were overjoyed. They were excited. They never dreamed they would ever experience something like this in their life. But they did. But you know what? It's a wonderful life when you find Jesus. Amen? It's a wonderful life when you find Jesus. Now, I've often wondered about these shepherds. I wonder if any of those shepherds later on ever traveled up to Nazareth just to check on that boy and see how he was doing growing up. What if they ever did that? Maybe. We don't know. I wonder if any of those shepherds actually became disciples and followers of Jesus. Remember, Jesus not only had 12, at one point he had 70, and on the day of Pentecost there were at least 120. Could any of those shepherds have been a part of that? Now, it would have been... When Jesus began a ministry, it would have been 30 years later, so it depends on how old those shepherds were. You know, I believe there were older shepherds. I believe there were younger, possibly even some teenage shepherds in that group. Some boys. So it's possible. One of the things that 
I really think about is, is it possible that even one of those shepherds were there at Mount Calvary when they hung Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, on the cross? What would they have been thinking? They would have had to have been heartbroken. They knew what the angel told them. This is the Savior. And they're watching the Savior die. And not really understanding that part of why the Savior came was to die. That's what made him the Savior. Jesus wouldn't be our Savior if he hadn't died on the cross, my beloved. And while they did put him on the cross, I want you to understand right now, if Jesus had not wanted to go to that cross and not had not willingly gone to the cross, there ain't nobody there would have been able to put him on there. We're talking about the powerful son of the living God. No hand would have been able to lift itself against the son of God that day had not Jesus willingly went to the cross and he did it for you and he did it for me. Amen. Amen. And while the birth of Christ is so exciting and wonderful, it's not the birth of Christ that brings salvation to us. It's the death of Christ and His resurrection. That's what brings salvation to the one who would believe. One thing is for sure, about those shepherds. They were not only shepherds, they were wise men. Because wise men and wise women still will see Jesus. And that's just the way it is. Amen? I am thankful for what happened on that wonderful, wonderful, glorious night. I am thankful that God did what he did for the whole world. And I'm thankful because I know that even though Christ was born, came into the world, I know he had to grow up. I know he had to, to do what he did on the cross. And it's hard to read and it's hard to know what he did. But he had to do it. And he did it for us. All of that was tied in with his coming. And I'm so thankful because I know what he's done for me personally. And those of you who have put your faith and trust in Christ, you know what he's done for you. It's not just about a little baby in a manger, but it's also about a cross on a hill. And Jesus hanging on that cross. But praise God. He rose from the grave on the third day after his death. And 40 days later, he left and he went right back up to heaven from where he originally had come. And the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And folks, that's where he is today. Jesus is alive and he's real. And if you've ever opened up your heart to receive Him as your Savior and Lord, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean. And if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He can give you the free gift of salvation. As I close this message out, I'd like to read a little poem. And this is a poem that was written a long time ago by Martin Luther. Martin Luther was the one who began the Protestant Reformation. It's a beautiful little poem about the baby Jesus. And here's the way it goes. It's titled, Our Little Lord. Our little Lord, we give thee praise. But thou hast deemed to take our ways. Born of Mary, a man to be. And all the angels sing to thee. The eternal Father's Son he laid, cradled in a crib of hay.
the everlasting God appears in our frail flesh and blood and tears. What the globe could not enwrap, nestled lies in Mary's lap. Just a baby, very wee, yet the Lord of all the world, you see. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. We call this the Christmas story. It's the story, as you know, God, of what you did for the world. Father, thank you. Thank you again for sending your son, Jesus, to a lost world. And Lord, over all the world is still lost today. There's so, so many that have not yet found Jesus Christ. And yet the Bible says that you are as near as our next breath. And God, you said in your word that if we will just seek you with all of our heart, we will find you. And so, Lord, anyone, anyone here today that has never, ever put their faith and trust in Jesus as Savior, and they may be asking, well, why do I need to do that? Because the Bible says we're all lost. We're in sin. We've done things wrong. We've broken God's laws, His rules. And that's sin. The Bible says lying is sin. If we've told one lie, that makes us a liar. And the Bible says that all men are liars. And so, Father, we do have sin in our life that needs to be forgiven. And that forgiveness comes only through Jesus Christ. We have to realize He is the Son of God. We have to know that He died on the cross for us in order to forgive us for our sins. It required a perfect blood sacrifice. And Jesus, you did that for us. And in a supernatural way that nobody can explain, that blood is still in effect today, 2,000 years from when it was spilled, and it still is there to wash away our sins and forgive us. I don't know how it works, Lord. I don't understand it, but... That's what you said you've done, and I've experienced it myself. I know that that blood can wash away sin. So I thank you for that. God, it's the only way we get into heaven through Jesus. Jesus, you said so. You said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except that person come through me. So the only way to get to heaven is through you, Jesus. That's why we need Christ. Lord, I pray now for anyone here today that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, that they might be willing to do that. I don't know if anyone feels that they need to step out and walk the aisle this morning and come to me and, and confess that. If they feel that they need to do that, I pray that they will. God, I just pray that you would move in our midst and show us where we really stand with you. Eternity is very real. We're all going someplace. And Father, we just got the word. My wife and I yesterday, a 50-year-old, that my wife knows to a degree, knows his sister real well. He was killed in a car wreck. thinking that he was going to enjoy his time with his family this Christmas, but he won't be there. And now they're looking at a funeral. Fifty years old, thinking he had a lot of life ahead, but he didn't. God, are we prepared for eternity? Do we know Jesus? I pray that we do. If we don't, that's why we have an invitation time right now. So that anyone who would like to put their faith in Christ at this moment, to prepare their heart and soul for eternity, they may do so. So, Father, we're going to have just a short hymn of invitation. And if someone needs to come to do that today, I pray that they will. You just move 
in this time and have your will in your way. But help us to constantly think about where we're going to spend eternity. Help us not lose sight of that. Bless the time now in this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand for just a moment?